And we've got plenty of things that we're talking about over at bangthebook.com as well. We've got all of the FBS bowl games previewed. I'll write up the Celebration Bowl here tonight. Uh, then we've got NBA, NHL, and college basketball situational betting articles. We'll get some updated NFL power ratings from Danny Borgs. I went through and updated my power ratings here this morning based on some of the NFL draft announcements and some of the news about suspensions and things of that sort that we have going on. So make sure you head over to bangthebook.com, check all that out. Very, very good resources for you over there. While you're there, get involved in those free pick contests as well and try to get yourself some cash prizes. Also check out our sportsbook reviews, including our look at DSI Sportsbook, where you can use that promo code BTB200 for a 100% deposit match bonus for the sportsbook up to $500. 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino up to $500. At Bet DSI, it's only a game until you bet it. And definitely check out our YouTube page as well. I'm doing some more video stuff over there. Unfortunately, I took an 0-3 last night on the Tuesday three-pack video. Uh, nowhere to go but up for the Thursday one. So tune in today. I'll do a Wednesday weekend look-ahead video. Thursday, we'll do the three-pack. And then Friday, we'll have a little fun with one of the videos there. So check out our YouTube page. Just go to YouTube.com, search Bang the Book. You'll also find videos over there from Brian Blessing, who does a great job with those and also was great on yesterday's edition of Bang the Book Radio. We got one guest, at least, for today's show. That is professional hated camper Brian Leonard from wagertalk.com. Brian, how's it going today, man? Uh, everything's going good. I'm, unfortunately, a little under the weather, so I hope my my voice doesn't give out. But uh, other than that, yeah, everything's great, and uh, everything's going good on this end. Sounds good, man. Good to have you back on the program here. I know you were away for a couple of uh, couple of weeks here hanging out with your dad, so I'm glad to hear that went well, and good to have you back on the program and uh, you know pretty good time to be back in the saddle because bowl games starting here on Saturday let's start with some general bowl betting tips here just kind of some overview types of things what's kind of a starting point for you Brian I mean obviously these lines have been out for a couple of weeks time now so there have been some people that have kind of batted these numbers around a little bit but what's you know generally the starting point for you well one thing I take a look at is during the season teams go up and down all season long. Um, if it was in the regular season, I'd spend more time looking at what they have done lately uh, because there's such a, a break between the end of the season and the bowls. I am more interested in what they've done on the entire season as opposed to what they have done the last three or four games. I think that can get you some nice, uh, some nice value because the momentum that you did have uh, going going the last few weeks of the regular season is no longer there. It's a different situation. Uh, one of the other things I took a look at is the teams that started the season, they ranked basically in the top 25, and for some reason or another, either there was injuries, suspensions, whatever, they didn't play as well and didn't end the season in the top 25. And uh, they may have something, a little extra chip on their shoulder to try to, sh- to try to show people that they were better than what they showed the- on the season. Um, you do know that they have, this, they have the, uh, the personnel, they have the talent, because they wouldn't have been ranked highly coming into the season. And we see that a lot um, come bowl time is, okay, well, we had a disappointing season, but if we end the year on a, on a nice note here, it's something good coming into the next year. Um, always starting to take a look at strength of schedule these teams have played. Sometimes when you get in a bowl, you're playing somebody that um, is tougher than what you've played all year long. Or if you're in the SEC, for the most part, you're playing somebody that you're playing down to. Uh, speaking of the SEC, I like to look at how certain conferences do. I've always known that the MAC was very weak in the bowl season, and they're always overrated. Uh, Mac wasn't very good this year, and we'll see how that works out for them in the bowls. The SEC, on the other hand, everybody knows that's the best conference in college football, and yet every year they do very well against the spread because of the coaching in the SEC. Quality coaches bring the teams together, even though you're disappointed that you're, you're playing a lesser team. You, uh, because of as good as your practices have been all season long and the personnel and the talent you have, uh, the SEC is one of those conferences where I look to play on those teams. Um, another thing that I look at is I like to take the top 10 rushing uh, offenses um, coming out of the season 
the playoffs and the bowls. Uh, we've we've talked in the past about teams like Washington State. A lot of these high-profile uh, passing offenses, they need to play every day, every week. And you can take a look at the Washington State, the Texas Tech, those type of teams. When they have a bowl or when they have a bye week, it takes them a while to get going again. Well, now they've got they've been off for a month, and now they got to get that run and shoot or whatever the timing is down for their ball game. And the teams that run the football don't have to worry about that because the, the timing isn't nearly as important in running the football as it is in throwing the football. So I take a look at uh, the teams that run the football very well. Not usually not all ten of the top ten make the bowls. I think this year there's six or eight that make the bowls, and those are teams that have done very well because they continue to do what they have done in the past. And um, that's one of the reasons why the, uh, the, the military schools have always done well when it comes to the bowls because of that situation. They, they are who they are, and they're not going to change come bowl season. And the only difference is the other teams get, you know, a lot more time to prepare for it, but uh, they still, still seem to do very well anytime you can run the football. Um, just some of the things I take a look at. Um, but, yeah, that, that pretty much covers a lot of it. Um, you know, take a, always take a look at the special teams. That's something that gets uh, a little bit overlooked during the regular season. But now you can go back and say, you know, we're getting one of the top special team units playing the team that's not very good at special teams. Always take that into account. And one thing I did this year, I haven't done in the past, but uh, I wanted to make sure I went back and did this so I could analyze it a little bit in the off season. is I went back, Phil Skills got a program where um, he basically rates out the games. He makes his own game grades. Uh, I don't make my own game grades, so I use Phil's. And, you know, you can pick that up for $50 for the year or something. But you go back, and I went through all of his game grades, and I made uh, lines based off of that also. Because a lot of times the team will outplay the opposition completely, and that seven fifty thing happens, or they turn the ball over four times or whatever, and they lose the games. Uh, that kind of evens it out a little bit, so you may have a little bit of a an advantage in that. So it's just a few things I'm gonna look at in the off season to try to improve my handicapping. And uh, to be honest with you, it was not a good college football season for me. The NFL's been fine, everything else has been fine, but very disappointed in my college football this year. So obviously. Going to make some changes for next year and hopefully get it back on track. Well, a lot of things you hit on there, and, and it's nice that we're kind of carrying some of these concepts through with the different guests that we have here throughout this week. And, and that was one that we kind of talked about on Monday a little bit uh, with regards to you know, teams that were expected to do better this year. And, and a lot of times, you know, when you try to evaluate a team that underachieved or a team that overachieved, one of the best things, one of the best measures you can use is the against the spread record. So if you've got a team that was supposed to be pretty damn good and they didn't cover a whole lot of their games, those are good teams to back. No, I just going to say I agree that usually the teams that do very well against the spread during the season, people want to play them in the bowls. But as I said, because of that break and you're already paying a premium because they've been a moneymaker for you, um, I would much prefer a team who had a losing spread record going into the bowls and then nobody's talking about it. You're going to get more, more point spread value in that regard. And I apologize. They're doing some internet work around here, around the neighborhood. So uh, I apologize if I cut out at all on today's show, because I know that uh, there've been a lot of complaints about the, uh, the internet strength around here. And maybe that was the case there, but um, you know, that was again, something that we talked about earlier on in the week, because you know, you have these teams that are supposed to get to, you know, level X, Y, Z, and they wind up getting to level TUV, and it's just not where people expected them to be. So, back to the bowl games, you would expect those teams to be a little bit more motivated and say, you know what, maybe we didn't get where we wanted to get, but, you know, now we have a chance to at least end on a high note. And there's kind of a game that illustrates that on Saturday night, and this isn't one that we're going to talk about specifically, but the more I've been thinking about the New Orleans Bowl and looking at how Middle Tennessee – you know, probably had the goal to win Conference USA. They get to the title game. They lose the title game. There's unfinished business for them. For Appalachian State, already 10 wins, won the Sun Belt, won the inaugural Sun Belt Conference Championship game. Their coach goes to Louisville. Maybe they're kind of satisfied with everything that happened for them. There's not much equity for them in beating Middle Tennessee State and doing so in comfortable fashion. If they were playing a major conference, you know, Power 5 team, 
maybe there's something more on the line there. And th- this game could go completely off the rails. I could be totally wrong. But I think you do get these spots, particularly earlier on in the bowl season, where I, I just think that there is one team that has a little bit more to play for. Yeah, definitely. And stats have proven that uh, if you're looking for underdogs, uh, you want to play them early in the bowl season. Makes a lot of sense because you have a lot of favorites. <laughs> Excuse me. You have a lot of favorites that uh, are are not motivated at that point. And uh, you talk about Tennessee State, obviously the coach and the quarterback uh, getting the last chance to play together before he graduates. Obviously, son and father. Um, so that's a big deal for them. Uh, Appalachian State is one of those teams that is excellent at the level they're at. They're sort of like a South of Florida where they could beat the hell out of a team, but they want better competition. And this is not the better competition for them. Uh, they're a sizable favorite in this game. And, uh, I can definitely see a letdown here, although Appalachian State's got the better talent. Uh, better talent doesn't always win out. So, uh, yeah, that, that's something in Middle Tennessee State that you might have uncovered something there. That, uh, and I, and I would recommend you know, I, I don't do a lot of money line playing on other dogs. In the bowl, early bowl season, uh, put a little bit of your back roll, as my friend Lee said, sprinkle a little bit on uh, those other dogs. And they, they pay off big in the early part of the bowl season before you get to the, the big games where the, the players from both teams are you know, possibly going to the NFL, that kind of thing. Uh, they've got better things to think about in the future. But, you know, for these early bowl games, this is it for these teams. They're, they're excited to be there on national TV. How many times you get to see it? You know, in North Texas or uh, or uh, uh, Tulane on, on national TV. So these guys got a chance to get out there and prove it. And uh, you're going to always see a, a good matchup. And one of the things that uh, I didn't mention is people, you know, what people always say, well, this team doesn't want to be there, that team doesn't want to be there. It's so hard to judge. You know, sure, sure, when the, when the, when the uh, lines come out and they, and they have their invites, uh, sure, somebody might be a little bit disappointed to have to go somewhere, but that was a month ago. That was three weeks ago. Now that they're there, it's a whole different situation. So that's one of the things that I like to look at in these bowls is live betting because you can definitely tell who's come to play and who hasn't come to play just by watching the first few uh, series of the game. And I think that's the way you can really make good money during the bowl season. I think so, too, because, you know, we're, we're talking about these matchups here of, of non-conference opponents. And in a lot of cases, we haven't seen teams play non-conference opponents since week four or week five, something like that. So you, know, you kind of have a little bit of uncertainty and, and unfamiliarity there. But also, you know, like you said, I mean, when we talk about motivation, we're, we're largely guessing. You know, we're talking about spots that look like there's going to be a motivation gap, a motivation discrepancy here. But it may not be the case. And you actually need to see the teams between the lines to see if one team is actually motivated or not. And I also think, too, that maybe some teams come in unprepared, unmotivated. But once you, know, once you get hit, once you hit somebody in the mouth, you're in that game. So I think there are some second-half betting opportunities on teams that, you know, maybe we think they're not motivated coming into the game. But then once they get into the game, they're all going to kind of look at each other and go, you know what, we don't really want to lose our last college football game together. And so, you know, maybe they make some adjustment, adjustments in the second half. I think it's especially true, as you mentioned, of, you know, maybe teams that are the better team to where, yeah, maybe they come in either a little fat and happy or just not as motivated. But then as the game goes along, they kind of make it known that they're the better team. I think that's a very important angle to keep in mind here. And something that's also important for our listeners in general, you don't always have to play full games. Sometimes you're going to find a much better opportunity, probably most times, you're going to find a much better opportunity after that game has already started. That's, that's not really true. And uh, another way to play it is the first half. Uh, usually the underdog gets more than half uh, for the first half. So if the line's 14, you're probably getting eight in, in the first half, which is uh, obviously with the key numbers of three and seven. That's, that's very important. And anytime you're playing a shorter time span, that's more of a chance for the underdog to cover. If if Alabama was playing Citadel and in the first half of the game, you know, the game was tied. There's just one example of one game. But obviously Alabama wasn't prepared for that. But once the second half started, they go, hey, 
you know, what the hell's going on here? And they run and blow them out. You see a lot of that where the team that's a better team just isn't ready to get in there while the, the team that's the underdog can't wait to play. Hey, I get to play Alabama. And you see that all the time. And they're able to get out there and get that early lead. But as the game goes on, if, if that Alabama game was, was four quarters, so obviously um, they lost the first two quarters, the blue off the second, and they played 40 quarters. The best quarters that uh, Citadel would have had would have been the first two because after that, Alabama is just such big, stronger than they are. As the game goes on, there'd be more of a more of a curve, a winning curve for Alabama. So um, when you're playing those lesser teams, playing them in the first half, to me, makes a whole lot more sense than playing them in the whole game. All right, so let's look at a few of these games here. And, and I don't think motivation is a problem for either team in the Las Vegas Bowl. Back up to a four-and-a-half-point favorite. We saw some fours out there. Uh, here this morning, a lot of those fours are gone. Pinnacle and the Greek still showing four, though, matchbook as well. So some of the sharper offshores out there in the marketplace. But, Brian, and I imagine you probably won't be going to this one this year. But what do you think about this matchup? Uh, it's actually a pretty good matchup. Uh, Arizona State was one of those teams coming into the season. Everybody was looking to bet against Herm Edwards. But I got to give my hat to, to Herm. He's, he's really got this team better than what I thought they were going to be. Um, you look at their team all, all season long, you know, they played some quality opponents. They uh, the win at Mich- against Michigan State at home early in the season, 16-13. That was more of a situation, and I've talked about that in the past, of uh, the Big Ten teams going west. That's a tough situation for them. But when you break down the game grades, um, you know, Phil gave 95 for Arizona State and 92 for Michigan State. So he was right there. That, that was a game that uh, they could have lost, but uh, they played right to what it was. Um, the loss to San Diego State now, the 28-21 loss, is looking worse because of the way the Aztecs finished the season. But then to go to Washington, only lose by seven. Washington wins that conference. So they haven't really, other than the Utah game, where they win that game 38-20, They've had a pretty easy second half of the schedule compared to the first, but Arizona State's deserving of being here. But Fresno State is one of those teams that just took advantage of weak competition. And you go back and you look on the season, their only loss was in Minnesota. Minnesota is a decent team, but they lose that game 21 to 14. Um, in the uh, it, it fills uh, game score, it was 93 to 91, so it was right there for the taking. And they did lose that turnover battle by one, but. Fresno got, you know, they played some weaker competition, obviously, in their own conference. And then they played Toledo in a down year. They crushed them in Nevada uh, before Nevada got good at the end of the season. So uh, my line on this game is I've got Fresno State uh, favored here by by more than what the line is. My line says to play Fresno. But you're also playing a team that played a lesser competition as the season goes on. I still – I still uh, – prefer Fresno here. I think out of the, out of all the uh, group of five teams, Fresno, at least to me, is the best out of that group. Uh, Central Florida is very good, but Central didn't play anybody. Um, I think Fresno has got something to prove here, and uh, they want to prove that they should have been the team that uh, everybody was talking about. And I prefer the Fresno State team here. Plus, they play here all the time, being, this, being in the uh, conference. They're, they're very familiar with it. Um, so uh, slight lean there to Fresno State in this one. All right, so let's go to the Camellia Bowl. Eastern Michigan, Georgia Southern. This one up from pick to as high as two and a half out there in the marketplace. And, Brian, it certainly does look like that. Uh, you mentioned earlier that Mac not really doing very well in bowl games here over the last few years. Seems like that's kind of playing a role here in the betting market as this is one of a handful of Mac teams seeing money come in against them. Yeah, this is one of the games that I pointed out earlier with the rushing advantage. Georgia Southern's a team that runs the football. Uh, they finished in the top ten in rushing this year, so there's no no uh, no drop off from Georgia Tech in the rushing department. You've got an Eastern Michigan team here playing in the MAC, as you mentioned, one of the worst conferences in uh, in the country. Eastern uh, finished the season with wins over Central Michigan, Akron, and Kent State. Um, none of those teams are any good. Uh, they did lose to Army, and a lot of teams have lost to Army this year. And hats off to to the boys from West Point. They they had a great season 
but you go back and take a look at the teams. They beat Toledo before Toledo got halfway decent, I guess. It was still a terrible year for Toledo to beat Ball State. Uh, they lost to Western Michigan. They were playing well. Lost to Northern Illinois, probably the best team in this conference, along with Buffalo. Lost to San Diego State, and they lost to Buffalo. So it's a situation here where the teams that they have lost to, or there's some teams that run the football very well. Um, one of them, Northern Illinois. Uh, Buffalo's got a good running game, and they also have a good cornerback. Um, Jordan the Southern right now is a team that uh, obviously from a lesser conference also, but the, the uh, running situation definitely helps helps them here. Uh, their losses on the season were to Clemson, obviously, but if you look, go back and look back, it was 38-7. to seven. Uh, They actually played Clemson pretty much as well as anybody else sees in log, and then they lost to ULM. Uh, they lost to uh, Troy, actually won both of the turnover battles in those games, but uh, lost the game outright. Uh, I prefer the Georgia Southern side here, um, but it's probably not going to be on my card as for something I bet. All right, one more game to touch on here. This is the Boca Raton Bowl. We haven't talked about this one yet. Northern Illinois, UAB. UAB up from a one-point favorite to a two-and-a-half-point favorite. A lot of places showing two-and-a-half, minus fifteen out there. Another MAC team getting faded, and this is, again, kind of a, a growing theme here in the bowl season. Uh, not a whole lot of believers in NIU out there. Yeah, you take a look at Northern Illinois going back uh, the bowl season in the last six years. Uh, they bowled five of those years. They lost four out of those five. Uh, the only game that they actually won was uh, my mistake. They did not win a game. That was the last game of the season. That was not a bowl game. So you go back, they lost their last five bowl games. Uh, they lose to Duke 36-14, to lose to Boise 55-7, to lose to Marshall 52-23, Utah State 21 to 14, and then Florida State 31 to 10. It, uh, if I remember right, that was the year that Northern Illinois was terrific all season long. Got to the bowl game, played a more, more, uh, a better team than they were. A team with a lot, a lot better talent, and they got crushed 31 to 10 there. So, this is a team in Northern Illinois who has not had good success um, in the bowl season. I could definitely understand that. UAB is one of those teams that. They've been very good all season, but they really crashed and burned uh, at Texas A&M and uh, Middle Tennessee, and then they got back in the in the league championship game. But, uh, yeah, the UAB team has decided I prefer here. Um, Northern Illinois, I talked about special teams earlier. Northern Illinois is terrible on special teams. Uh, they got that one-dimensional offense. They run the ball well, don't pass the ball well. UAB's defense has just been phenomenal all season long. Uh, when they did step up in class, they, they struggled a little bit. But are they really stepping up in class here against Northern? Maybe slightly, but uh, that one-dimensional Northern offense is going to keep UAB on their toes. And uh, unless Northern Illinois puts in some plays, uh, more plays in the in the uh, passing game here that they could have some success with, uh, UAB should be able to control this game because of their defense. Obviously, with the line, the total of what they have in this game, they're not expecting a lot of offense. So. Um, I prefer the UAB side. I think they've got the better defense overall. All right, let's transition over to the NFL here and talk about a couple of games in the professional ranks for Sunday. And we'll go ahead and start with the first game on the board here, Dolphins versus Vikings. Minnesota seven-point favorite. Seeing some sevens with extra juice out there now popping. Bet online minus $1.17. Bookmaker minus $1.15. What do you think about this one here, Brian, with – Minnesota off of another tough loss, but they are stepping down in class. Miami off that last second win over New England. What do you think about this game? For uh, basically a situational standpoint, you've got to love Minnesota here. Miami off of that game against New England last week. Uh, That's their big rival. They always play well against New England at home. And the way they won that game, it was just shocking to everybody. And so good for Miami in that regard. And uh, they played Minnesota before they finished the season with a couple of AFC teams. Uh, Minnesota has got the uh, short week after playing Seattle against New England the week before. Uh, they lose both of those games. We talked earlier in the season, about uh, probably about a month ago, about the schedule that Minnesota has. They're coming out of the bye week. They were playing Chicago and Green Bay. Those were the two big games. Sure, they'd like to beat New England, but uh, it's not important. That's an AFC contest. And then the game against Seattle on Monday Night Football, in which the offense looked terrible. There's been a shakeup 
in the Vikings uh, coaching staff since then, and uh, and the coach is going. Uh, coach Zimmer is going to start worrying about the defense a little bit more. He's going to leave the play calling to somebody else, and and that's going to be something that's, that can be nothing but positive for the Minnesota Vikings. Um, normally, they wouldn't get so excited to play an AFC team this time of the season, but they need every win they could get. Uh, they finish the season at Detroit, and then they play Chicago in the final week. And again, the Chicago may not have any interest in. They've already locked up uh, the, the division. Basically, um, they're pretty much set where they're at for uh, for uh, the playoff situation. So, Minnesota if gets if they get back on track here against Miami, they can finish that that season at three and zero and get back to, into the playoff hunt, be back in the back in the wild card. So, it's very important for Minnesota here. Also, this is a terrific spot for a teaser. Uh, you like to cover. You like to cover the sevens and the, the threes here. So uh, I prefer uh, laying the seven right now. But if it did get up seven and a half, and that was your only choice, uh, Minnesota on a teaser is the way to go here. But uh, Minnesota's got the talent, but they just have not put the offense and the defense together, and that's been the problem for the Vikings all season long. Uh, but when you take a look at the personnel of these teams, Minnesota is far better than Miami is, at least in my opinion. And uh, from a, from a need standpoint, although you hate to hate to play in the must win situations at the end of the season, um, you paid a little bit of a price for that. But I think Minnesota is the way to go here. One more game I want to hit on with you, Brian, and and this is one that I think is uh, is a pretty interesting game for a variety of different reasons. The Cowboys taking on the Colts. This game three thirteen three fourteen coming up here on Saturday. You know, I think right now, honestly, and this kind of surprises me because I, I wasn't real big into Dallas early in the season. I think both of these are play on teams with Indianapolis anywhere from a two and a half point favorite to a three point favorite at even money or plus money. Yeah, this is a game that I wanted to play on both teams, and obviously we can't. Uh, but uh, Dallas has played a terrific ball. Uh, you know, you take a look at what they've done as of late. Uh, they, you know, they got the Washington on Thursday. They got the New Orleans on Thursday, and then they played Philadelphia. Uh, the final of that Philadelphia game last week, with the you continue to go for the touchdown, that was the way you're supposed to do. A lot of these coaches will sit there and they go, "Well, I just kicked the field goal at this point." And, uh, but finally, Dallas does the correct thing and it paid off. Uh, that's something that uh, we don't normally see out of the Cowboys' uh, management staff there and uh, coaching staff. So maybe they gained some uh, positive momentum out of that. But keep in mind, uh, the last three games for Dallas have all been at home, uh, Washington, New Orleans, and Philadelphia. Um, when you're taking them on the road this year, Carolina, they lose that game 8-16-8. Uh, Seattle, they lose 24-13. Houston, they lose 19-16. Washington, they lose 20-17. And so uh, they it took them a while before they started playing well on the road. So I don't know if I could trust them to win on the road against this Indy team who – who uh, was nice to us last week. We had a big play on the Colts uh, against uh, Houston and won that game straight up and pretty much led the entire game. Uh, the Colts are a team that uh, has been just a few breaks away from being in the playoff picture, and, uh, and unfortunately I don't think they're going to get there this year, but they've got some things to build on, and uh, this is a team that's protected quarterback all season long, and when you have an elite quarterback and you can give him some protection, uh, you can have a lot of success. So. Um, prefer a lean with Indy here, but I really don't want to bet against either one of these teams. I think the line's about right right now. I think one thing that is pretty interesting here, and obviously the Dallas defense looks a little bit different at this point in time, but Colts head coach Frank Reich game planned for this Dallas defense each of the last two years as the, uh, as such a you know big part of the offense there with Philadelphia. So you know, he's got a little bit of experience here game planning for this Dallas defense. He's got some good personnel, obviously, with Andrew Luck. Maybe this is a spot that does play out pretty well for Indianapolis. I'll be curious to see you know, where this one sets up from a contest standpoint and also what the consensus winds up being out there in the betting market. Right now, it looks like Indianapolis, the preferred side, but it uh, you know, should be a line that's definitely worth watching. .com. What's going on over there right now, Brian? Uh, going to do videos today. It's been a while since I've done them. The uh, last couple of weeks, obviously, I've been out of town. But going in to do videos, excited for that to see the guys. Uh, I don't promote myself a lot here um, on my individual plays, but I do have a, a 5% play going in the Thursday NFL game, uh, 7-0 on my 5% plays in the NFL so far this season. So 
Uh, can't expect to hit 100% on the year, but we've done very well when we stepped up in the NFL, and you can pick that up over at the site at wagertalk.com, and it comes with a 150% guarantee. If the play does win, you get 150% of what you paid for the play back into your gambling account, so it's a really good deal. It's a way to keep us from putting up big plays all the time, and you see that certain sites, they got a game of the year going every day, so um, we don't call anything a game of the year. We call something a 5%. And um, we have, uh, while we get, like to get as many people in as we can to get a hold of that, if we don't win, we can get penalized. So it's it's really great what they're doing with their way to talk when we do have a step-out play. We've got one going on Thursday. Well, you know you're going to want to have action on that Chargers versus Chiefs game. Best game of the weekend, so, you know, why not take a look at what Brian's got there. With that five-star play, again, Brian Leonard over at wagertalk.com, at B. Leonard Sports on Twitter. Hope you feel better, bud, and we'll talk to you again next week. Sounds great. Uh, Looking forward to it. Thank you.